All right, well, let's turn to Isaiah 40 for our scripture reading today. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11 will be our responsive reading for this morning. Let's read this together. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, the, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, this reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the limbs, lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. But Romans chapter 1, verse 21, I want to read this for you and uh, just share a few thoughts with you this morning out of the, the second half of Romans chapter 1. Last week, we talked about the gospel, the gospel of God, that the gospel belongs to God, that it's the story of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the euangelion, the, 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 that good news that comes from a far country that the war is over. Hostilities have ceased between earth and heaven, that God is no longer at war with earth. Earth might be battling him, the human race might be battling God, rebelling against him, shaking our fist at him, but God has ceased hostilities with us through the cross. There will come a day of judgment. There will come a time when God's patience and his endurance and his long suffering uh, will be done. But now is the time for man to be saved. And so we're going to pick up where we, a little bit where we left off last time here at Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says here, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, <clears throat> for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What you notice what he says there in verse number 28. He says, God gave them over. God gave them over. I'm going to just ask you to think about something this morning. It's, it's, it's a scary thought. 
to challenging thought, to controversial thought. But Paul says it right here in Romans 1, verse 28. What are we going to do when God gives up? What do you do when God gives up? He says here that God gave them over to a reprobate mind to allow them to continue in the lust of their of themselves. Now, as we read there, I think you probably noticed, I hope, that there's a progression that takes place. It starts off with something as simple as unthankfulness, being ungrateful. And the categories of sin just get worse and worse as we go through it, as far as what we think of as bad sin. The, the immorality that starts to unfold as we go through it. It, just, it starts off with unthankfulness and then the foolish attitudes, verse 22. Verse 23 talks about idolatry and how idolatry gets started. And then verse 24, the uncleanness of, uh, of just immorality and promiscuity. And then it gets into things like homosexual activity and, and things like that. And it just continues to go down uh, from there. And so as we look at this, we see that there's a progression to sin. That sin rarely ever stays as stays static, stays locked in. That this will be, uh, once I give myself over to sin in this area, this self-destructive behavior, it rarely stays as innocent as we think it is. It usually starts as something small, and then it gets worse. And we go downhill. And unless some sort of corrective action takes place, until we get that kick in the knee that says, stop it, until we hit that moment of, I can't do this anymore, it gets progressively worse. Just as human beings, we're bent that way. Think about the the struggles that people have with dependencies and addictions. When a person begins to take a drug, and it might be a prescription drug, might be something the doctor says, this is what you need. But a lot of those that are um, dependent uh, form, dependency forming, habit forming, um, addictive drugs that are good, they have a good purpose. Over time, a dose of 10 milligrams doesn't have the effect that it used to have. And so we increase it to 20 milligrams or we start doubling what we take so that we can get the same impact. It's kind of like coffee. Do you know coffee is, uh, is a drug? It is. You bunch of addicts. You bunch of junkies. I'm the worst of the bunch, I promise you. I like coffee. There's just something good about it. But it, is, it, it, has a, it has a drug effect on us. It's very similar to a lot of other drugs. Uh, you'd be amazed to see the similarity between caffeine and cocaine under a microscope. It's crazy. But uh, caffeine is one of those things that, do you remember the first time you started drinking coffee? And whoo, you got that pep, little kick of energy. And man, that felt good. I'm ready to go now. And it was just one little small cup or maybe half a cup. I remember as a kid, my mom used to drink about a half a cup of coffee. Probably She still does to this day. Uh, drink a half a cup of coffee. Uh, it's about that much coffee and about that much milk and sugar on it. And she'll drink that every morning. And at, on Sundays and Saturdays when we were home, she'd drink that and she'd put it, she'd put it in the same spot every day when she was done with it. And she'd say, Brian, if you want to go ahead and finish that, you can. I was like 12, 13 years old. And I remember drinking it and boy, wow, that's good. I mean, I like sugar, so it wasn't the coffee I was enjoying, it was the sugar. But that was the beginning of my dependency. My own mother turned me over to an addiction. Uh, but that, when I first started drinking it, just a little bit was all I needed. It, wow, that gave me that shot of energy that I was looking for. And now, years and years and years later of drinking it, I've got a 32-ounce uh, little uh, Ozark Trail cooler that I use. looks like one of those, it's a knockoff Yeti deal. And uh, I, I fill that thing up with coffee and I drink that. And by about two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm ready for another cup. You know, let's get some more brewing, shall we? I'm like my dad in that way. He was that way. But it's what's happened. Why? You would think that drinking all that coffee, man, Brian, you'd be over the moon. I mean, aren't you just, how do you sleep at night drinking that much coffee? Well, it's because I've built up a dependency to it, right? It has progressed within me. Um, This dependency has progressed over time, and there's nothing wrong with drinking coffee, but, you know, if you're drinking too much caffeine, back it off, would you? I mean, you know, 
you, you wonder why you're so anxious and, and jittery all the time. It might have something to do with it. Can't sleep well at night? Drop one cup of coffee a day. It'll make a difference. But there's nothing sinful about drinking a cup of coffee. But my point is that human, as human beings, we are wired to go deeper and deeper into destructive things. We're never satisfied with what it is right now. We always try to go a little further, a little deeper, get a little bit further into it. And before we know it, we're in a place that, man, I didn't know that this was how it's going to wind up. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It will always cost you far more than you want to pay. It's just the truth of it. But here's the good news. That's bad news. And remember, I told you last week that when we talk about the book of Romans, the first few chapters, God's diagnosing a very serious sickness within us. And this sickness needs to be called out for what it is. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's going to tell us that that bottle on the shelf of your life is poison. It's not peppermint. It's not something you like. It's poison. It's arsenic. It's going to kill you. It's destructive. It's damaging. If I go to the doctor and I've got a serious illness, I don't want the doctor to beat around the bush about that. Now, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear bad news. Nobody likes bad news from the doctor. Brian, you've got high blood pressure. You've got uh, onset of diabetes or whatever. By the way, none of those are true. I'm I'm in great health, I think, so far. That's why I stay away from the doctor, by the way, so I never have to hear those things. But When I go to the doctor and if there's something wrong with me, I don't want him to sugarcoat it. Tell me what it is. If I go to the mechanic and I'm about to blow a a head gasket on the car, I don't want him to tell me, oh, it looks good, everything's fine. No, tell me that something's wrong here. If I go to the dentist and I'm going to need a root canal because I'm not taking care of my teeth or gums or whatever, I don't want him to say, oh, you're you're doing good. Don't worry too much about it. Tell me what it is. Don't, Don't lie to me. Tell me the facts of the matter. God's doing that here. He's not piling on us to make us feel miserable. He's not piling on us because he wants us to hate ourselves and loathe ourselves. He's just trying to lay the situation out for us. He's being very clear about the situation. God's just kind of that way. He doesn't pull a lot of punches. He speaks with grace. He speaks with compassion, but he also speaks with truth. And so that's what he's doing here. But not only is God telling us that there are some very serious diseases of the soul out there in this world, that there's a disease within our souls that we need to notice and and take very seriously. But he's also going to tell us that not only is there a progression to sin, but that God has progressively revealed his love for us. Look at verse number 17. Verse number 17. Paul tells us here, for therein, well, what does he mean by therein? In what? Well, what he talked about in verse number 16, the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So verse number 17, when he says, for therein, he's talking about in the gospel, there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he tells us here that God is revealing his righteousness. He's revealing his holiness. He's revealing his perfection through the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. We need him to do that. We need him to show us who he is and how he can save us from our sins because of what verse 18 says. Verse 18 says, because, I'm sorry, verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. We want to know the good news because the bad news is so bad. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. God has told us about sin. He's told us about wrath and judgment and all of these things. But praise the Lord, he didn't stop there. He told us that there's a cure to our sickness, that there's an antidote to the poison, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every sin sickness of the soul has been cared for because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. 
And it doesn't matter what tier or category of sin you and I are involved in, whether it's a sin of the mind or a sin of the soul or a sin that we commit on the outside of our bodies or a sexual sin or whatever category we want to put around our sin. It doesn't matter what tier we are on the progression of sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ has power to forgive that. So he tells us here that this world that we live in is progressing deeper and deeper into sin, but we're doing it knowing and seeing the evidence of God's love. He tells us here in verses 17 through 23 that we should know God's hand, that mankind knows God's hand. Verse number 19, he says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God is not hiding himself from us. He wants us to know who he is. And so he tells us that we can see God's hand of righteousness. Verse 17, what we talked about there, that this idea of the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, tells us that God is good. He is right. He is always just. He is always holy. He is always truthful. By the word, by the way, the word righteousness or righteous or some form of that appears over 50 times in the book of Romans. Paul's going to talk a lot about God's righteousness, that God is always right, that he's never been wrong one time. God has never made a mistake. He's never made an oopsie. He's never done anything uh, the wrong way. They say when you're, on the den- when you're in the dentist chair, the word you never want to hear the dentist say is oops. God's never done that. He's never made a mistake. He is a righteous God, but he is also a God of holiness. Verse number 18 tells us that. The wrath of God. The wrath of God. Now, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. God tells us that later on in the New Testament, that the anger and the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God, but God's wrath is always pure. It's always perfect. It's never, it never hits the wrong target. God never gets angry for the wrong reasons. By the way, parents, grandparents, we have to be careful about the way that we discipline, don't we? We discipline our kids, grandkids, whatever it might be. We've got to be careful how we discipline because uh, it's not good enough to discipline a kid just because you upset me or I don't like that. That's not a good enough reason to discipline. Uh, I had a, a pastor that used to say, don't discipline in anger, because when you discipline out of anger, whether it's a spanking or something like that, or wh- whatever form of punishment you give, uh, if it's something as serious as corporal punishment or go stand in the corner, when you are punishing someone out of anger, that's selfish motives, that's selfish reasons behind it, and certainly, and he even went so far as to say, you can take it up with him if you don't like this. I'm not saying it, he's saying it. But he was known for saying that to spank or punish corporal punishment, inflict corporal punishment on a child in anger was akin to child abuse. Because you're not punishing them to make them better, you're punishing them to make you feel better. You're not trying to improve them, you're trying to make your situation better. You're inflicting that upon them. Something to consider, something to think about. But God doesn't punish the way that we punish. God doesn't chastise the way that we get on somebody's case. God does it with purity and righteousness and holiness. And God has not been secretive about it. Now, we've done a great job of trying to conceal God's wrath. The American church has made an industry out of hiding the fact that God has a wrathful side. He has a just side to him, and there's just a certain limit that you don't want to cross with God. We've done a fantastic job of sweeping that under the carpet, sweeping that under the rug and pretending that that doesn't exist. But the problem is, is when we hide that, we are hiding a part of God's revelation of himself. God meant to show us that he has wrath. God meant to show us that he is just. God meant to show us that he is holy. He didn't make an oopsie there either. He wants us to know that. Why? Because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Judgment will come, and so God wants us to be aware. God wants us to know. They say to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And so it's important that we don't hide that. Now, we don't write that all over posters and stand on the side of the road and tell people God's going to get you. It's no way to present the gospel. But we certainly don't want to conceal it either and pretend that it doesn't exist. He tells us that we should know God's hand of wrath, but then he also tells us that we should know his hand of creation. This is a big emphasis of Paul here in Romans 1, the hand of creation with God. It says in verse number 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's no reason that somebody who wants to find God should not come to a place where they at least believe in him because the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament, the sky, shows his handiwork. Walk out into the evening sky and tell me that that all got there by accident, that there wasn't some kind of divine purpose to that. Think about the fact that you go one planet closer to the sun, and you'll, if, if we jump one planet over closer to the sun, we'll all burn up. Jump one planet away from the sun, and we'll all freeze to death. But here in this one spot in our solar system, all the life that is in the universe that we've been able to find up to this point is all locked into this one little ball in this one little spot rotating around this one sun. And tell me that that could have happened by accident. We have an atmosphere that we can breathe and rain falls and it evaporates and goes back up into the atmosphere. We can grow crops. We can feed cattle. We can do the things that we need to do to make a living and survive and raise families and do all these things. And this is the only spot in the universe that you can do that and tell me that this is an accident. Paul goes so far as he says, it's clear, crystal clear. He says, you can clearly see the hand of God in the creation of the world around us. But why did God make it so clear? Why did he make it so obvious? So that on the day of judgment, when man stands before God and says, I was looking for you, but I couldn't find you, God can say here in the end of verse number 20, you are without excuse. You have no excuse for not believing in God. Every sunrise painted by the finger of God. Every sunset painted by the paintbrush of God. And yet we have the audacity to say, I just don't know if God's out there. Paul says, you're without excuse. God says, you're without excuse. We should be able to see his hand. Then he tells us that we should be able to know his design. We should be able to know his design. Look at verse number 28. He says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Because we refused to acknowledge God and because we started to worship the creature more than the creator of those creatures, God says that we go further and further into our own self-defilements. We go deeper and deeper into our own depravity. No surprise whatsoever to me that our culture is going deeper and deeper into sinful lifestyles and ways of thinking that don't even jibe with reality. And we just make up truth now, and your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. And it's no surprise at all. When you don't like to retain God in your thinking, when you don't like to retain the thought of God as a reality, this is exactly what Paul told us was going to happen. And it all starts with just putting God out of your mind, putting God out of your life, just refusing to listen to him. Even as Christians, we have to beware. We have to be careful. Now, you might not stumble off into some thing that they talk about on the evening news. You might not get involved in something like that. But when we refuse to retain God in our minds, when we live as though he weren't real, 
Even though we might say with our lips, yes, I believe in God, yes, I believe in Jesus, but when our life does not prove that out, when we don't live like God is real, then don't be surprised if you find yourself getting into some things that you didn't think you'd ever find yourself in. Don't be surprised if you find yourself walking off into some things that, man, 10 years ago, I never would have done that. I never would have gotten involved in something like that. He tells us here earlier in the chapter that people hold the truth in unrighteousness. As human beings, that's what we do. We hold the truth in unrighteousness. But he doesn't mean like we hold it like you hold a newborn baby. You could get that idea, but uh, some, some, uh, some newer uh, translations have translated this as wrestle. That's what he means by hold. They've wrestled the truth. And it's not just wrestling with it, competing with it. It means to press it down, to wrestle it to the floor and hold it down. Like, a, like a, 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 an offensive lineman against a, a linebacker. His job is not just to keep him away from the quarterback. His job is to pancake him. You know what it means to pancake somebody? Put him flat on his back and hold him there. That's what we do to the truth. I don't like it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to it. Bam, shove it down. I don't want to believe in that, and so I'm going to come up with my whole system for thinking uh, differently so that I don't have to believe this thing that God has said. We're wrestling the truth to the ground. And God says, when you go down that road, you'll be amazed how far that road will take you. He gets into a whole list of things here that we could spend some time talking about here this morning. But what I really want us to think about is there in verse number 18, he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. By the way, the idea there is not that it has already been revealed, but that it is being revealed right now. It's, we've seen some of it, and he's revealing it over time. We're starting to see the justice and the judgment of God unfold. How does it show up? It shows up in the progression of sin. Why is it that God doesn't step in and stop these agendas that are being pushed in our society today? Why is it that God doesn't step in and stop all of the rampant, fill in the blank, whatever it is that you don't like today, right? I wake up some mornings and some days I rail against this and other days I wake up and I rail against that. That's just sort of my how I feel that day, what I'm upset about. But fill in the blank with whatever it is that you're upset about, why doesn't God just step in and take care of that? Why doesn't God just end that? I mean, he's a holy God, he's a just God. God, put it to, put it to an end. Just stop it right now. No, you don't understand. That's how God is revealing his judgment. It's a part of God's judgment. When a society turns against God and says, God, to the curb you go, God says, okay. You go ahead and you start living that lifestyle over there, and let's see how that treats you. Well, it doesn't fix anything. And so the natural response is, well, let's go a little deeper into it. We messed it up last time. Let's try it again, see if we can get it better this time. And go a little deeper into it. And God stands back and he says, I'm just, I'm right here. I'm standing right here just waiting for you to wake up and, and realize that there's no benefit to that. There's no profit in that. That's not getting you anywhere. It's just making things worse. But mankind just continues to slip further and further down the slope into our own destruction. And God stands by and he says, I gave you over to that. Not so that he could destroy us, not so that he could revel in our misery as a culture and as a society, but so that we could wake up, so that we could see that these things don't benefit. I mean, folks, whoever thought that we'd be growing up or living in a day and age when we don't even know the difference between men and women anymore? We can't even biologically define what a man is and what a woman is anymore without making somebody upset. I mean, whoever thought we'd be living in a day like that? How did we get here? God gave us over to that. He gave us over to that. It's a part of his judgment. He's revealing his judgment to us. Not so that he can destroy us. Not so that he can celebrate and dance on the grave of Western civilization but so that we might wake up and return to him. 
He's doing it so that we will see that this is just foolishness. This doesn't work. It's not getting us anywhere. But then in verse number 32, he shows us that if we do not accept and believe God's hand of righteousness, his wrath, his creation, if we do not accept his design for life, we will know his judgment. Verse number 32, he says, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Paul here is talking about Gentiles. Well, what are Gentiles? Well, Gentiles are people that aren't Jews. Okay? That's the only way to boil it down. You see, the Jews grew up with the Torah. They grew up with the Law of Moses. They grew up with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They were trained in that from the time that they were little kids. We pictured that in the synagogue scene at the Living Nativity last week. They had Torah school for little kids, little boys specifically. Um, But then they had the whole rest of the Old Testament, the writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah and the, the Psalms and the Proverbs and things like that. And so these were people that had been trained in the things of the Lord. And so when Paul's talking about all this rampant sin that is just accepted by society, he's not talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Gentiles. He's pointing out the problems that are going on in Gentile society and Gentile life. And the Jews at this point in the Roman church are sitting back as their pastors reading this letter from Paul. They're sitting back and they're listening to what Paul has to say. And they're looking over at the Gentiles and say, yeah, that's good preaching. You guys ought to listen to that. Man, that's exactly what you need to hear. That's what I've been saying. I've been telling people that, Paul. Nobody wants to listen to me. Well, next week when we come back, we're going to see that Paul's going to flip the tables. He's been setting them up for a surprise. When we come back next week and we come to chapter 2, we're going to see that God's hand of judgment does not just fall on people of a Gentile ethnicity. It's not just the Gentiles that have a problem. We come back next week, Paul is going to show us that all mankind needs God's grace. Religious people and unreligious people, practicing Christian and pagan alike, we need Jesus. There is no cure for this stuff outside of the gospel. There is no cure for the judgment of God except for the good news of Jesus Christ. He is our one and only hope. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the attention that was given here this morning. Lord, I pray that you bless each one that listened and, Lord, applied the, these thoughts to their lives. And Lord, help us to ask ourselves some questions this morning, to ask some questions of our hearts. If there's anything in our hearts, any dark corner of our hearts. Lord God, give us the grace to recognize that. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, if there's anything that's keeping us from knowing your grace, if there's anything that's keeping us from going deeper in our walk with you, God, reveal that to us this morning. Any, any secret sin in our life, Lord, bring that to the surface this morning. Bring that to our thinking today. Help us to wrestle with that. Lord, we don't want to wrestle with the truth. We want to wrestle with ourselves. We don't want to wrestle with righteousness. We want to wrestle with our sins. God, help us to live a life uh, that exemplifies that. 